Welcome to In the Lap of the Pods Queen podcast with Paul, Joe and myself, David. A big episode, this one. Huge. I think, lads. Aye, absolutely. Uh, quite big, yeah. Aye. Before we get started, though, a big thank you for listening. Please subscribe and spread the word. And if you'd like to support us, please buy some merch from our shop. You can find all the details on the website, lappods.co.uk. Alternatively, you can donate to us via PayPal if you would prefer. Seriously, any amount is appreciated. One pound is great. 50p is great. What I would say is, though, pay your bills. You know, put food on the table and, you know, put the heating on first, you know. And if there's anything left, then we'll have it. Is that okay? I disagree, man. We come first. <laughs> Controversial, there. Aye, men, aye. Everybody, everybody eats last. <laughs> we, we, we eat first and then you eat last. <laughs> Pick an order that works for you. <laughs> Gold. <laughs> so the address for PayPal is paypal.me forward slash lap pods. Let us know if you do and we'll give you a wee shout out on the pod as well. But I thought we should give a big mention to Douglas Curran, who made a very generous donation a while back, and we haven't mentioned it on here yet. So thanks again, Douglas. Um, I think we should give an honourable mention also to Stuart Charlesworth, who was the first ever person to order some merch from us. So cheers, Stuart, for getting the ball rolling there. Thanks, Um, man. Thanks to you guys both. And anybody else that's bought anything? Sweet. I would mention others, but they get mentioned plenty enough on this podcast, so I'm not going to bother. So, But thanks to them as well. As ever, a shout out to the Deep Dive Podcast Network. So we've got Rai at Sabbath Bloody Podcast, Nate and John at the Deep Purple Podcast, <laughs> Simple Man at Skinner Reconsidered, Scott at the Magician's Podcast, and finally the Governor, Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone Prime Cuts. Cheers for the great pods, gents. Just something I wanted to bring up, actually. Have you noticed that all of our pods are old dinosaur bands? Aye, yeah. yep, aye, yeah. yep, true. And, and what? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe Do you have a be problem the, with that? I don't really know. No, uh, it should be the deep, fo- deep fossil uh, dig network. Or something like that, you know what I mean? The dinosaur <laughs> dig. <laughs> yeah, uh, the fossil boys. That's it. Well, well, I'm sure we all have a very diverse taste in music. Um, well, we certainly do anyway, we promise you that. It's just that the call of a dinosaur, it's hard to resist, you know? So, Absolutely, yeah. man. Call of the mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so enough with the intros. Let's move on to the point of this episode. We are absolutely delighted to have a special guest on this podcast. He is a man that will be very familiar to Queen fans given that he played live with the band, as well as recording with them on the works, with Brian May on Starfleet and Freddie Mercury on Mr. Bad Guy. He also played with Queen on their last ever live performance in the US. The man is Fred Mandel. (laughs) Fred has had an excellent career so far, and if you're a fan of Alice Cooper or Elton John, you'll no doubt be aware of his work with them too. He was also drafted in to help Pink Floyd on some of the tracks for the Wall album. I mean, this guy is rock royalty. Are you nervous, boys? Yeah, a wee bit. Yep. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, So I suppose, rather than us telling you about Fred Mandel, let's get Fred to do that himself. Hey, David. Hello, Fred. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Excellent. Very well. So uh, we've got uh, we've got Paul and we've got Joe uh, with us as well. So um, I'm sure they want to say hello as well. <laughs> Hi, Fred. How do you do? Top of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what you guys say? <laughs> that's, I think that's Ireland. It's more Ireland. Irish. But, <laughs> but, but close we'll take, close we'll, enough. Yeah, exactly. 
And I was going to say, what's the difference? But then I know I'd get beat, beaten up in a dark street <laughs> shortly oh, thereafter. <laughs> no, no, I mean, certainly we've got a kinship with the Irish, so that's, that's all good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, Fred, how, how, how are you? You're, 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 you're calling in from LA, so how's things, how's things there? Pretty good. I, the only thing I'm not seeing myself here. Uh, yeah. Do I need to? Or let's it's see. It'd be great to see you, Fred, but I mean, it's absolutely your choice, you know. Oh, you mean you can't see me yet? We, no. we, can't, we can't see you, no, no. Oh, okay. Oh, hey, wait, I see why. Okay, because I haven't got my video started. There we go. <laughs> oh, oh fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lovely Sorry, I'm in, my, I'm in my studio here, but it's kind of a little messy because I haven't cleaned stuff up because it's been sort of a storeroom for quite a while now. So I uh, just got a bunch of guitars lying around here. So pardon my guitars, but... Oh, yeah, it, it, looks, <laughs> it, it looks fantastic. It looks, yeah, looks pretty good to me. <laughs> some, gold, some gold records in the background there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just, I just threw those things off. Those. Uh, <laughs> I don't even pay attention. To them. <laughs> Never noticed them. <laughs> yeah, I just happened to drop my Congressional Medal of Honor on the floor here. Oh, <laughs> let me pick it up. <laughs> fantastic, brilliant. <laughs> um well again uh thanks for thanks for joining us fred i mean we're really hey, my pleasure we're really genuinely um we're kind of finding it hard to put into words um, <laughs> how, how to say thank you and just yeah, yeah um, blown away man blown away you know we're yeah, just well hey I, I you know i got a lot of friends in scotland and stuff and we used to play there and always had a great time and hey i'm you know i i'm not uh i don't care who I talk, you know it seems like a a fun thing to do so why not absolutely yeah. cool man thank well, you the, it's much appreciated, Fred. Um, so, how are things in LA? Obviously, like um, you know, I know you're obviously Canadian, and you're you're now an American citizen living in LA just now. So, how, how how's life there just now, given the given the worldwide situation? Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm I've been Canadian until 2017, and I just got my dual citizenship then. So I'm both you know Canadian and American. But uh, I'm a member of the British Empire until about uh, 2017. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so now I'm, I'm dual. It's a little crazy here. I mean, Los Angeles had a very high uh, rate of uh, coronavirus. So, we, you know, we're outside the city somewhat, but still in our little town, there's still a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Um, I got a shot, which makes things a little better. But you know, oh, yeah. my wife's just sitting in; she's over here somewhere, awesome. uh, saying hi. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm waiting for her to get a little uh, shot too, and it just depends on when these things become available. But it's um, mm-hmm. it's been a little crazy situation, you know. Uh, my daughter lives in LA, and uh, it was chaotic. It's starting to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel now because yeah. things are starting to decrease quite rapidly. So um, we'll have to see what happens, you know. I'm hoping that uh, things will straighten out and we'll all start to have uh, some immunity or something going on. Yeah. I'm not sure how it is over there, but I know it's a little crazy in, in uh, London. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's certainly, you know, it's, it's looking like hopefully an end game to it. But um, we're very much still in a kind of lockdown situation in Scotland. Um, the, the rules are slightly different between Scotland and, you know, the, the, the four nations in the, the UK. So there are the slight differences. Um, yeah. Scotland's taken a bit more of a cautious approach um, to, to England, certainly. Um, but yeah, it looks, it's looking like it's hopefully heading, heading for somewhere, somewhere better, you know. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, um, so in our chat, Fred, we, you know, we obviously will be focusing on Queen being a Queen podcast, um, but we, if you'll indulge us, we want to talk about, you know, you know, some of the other artists you've worked with as well. And, um, sure, no problem. Because I think the, the, the listeners, you know, being music fans, you know, they're, they're going to want to hear this stuff. So, mm-hmm. so um, you know, I, I don't want to waste the opportunity to ask, ask about some no, of the I'm, other. I'm happy to talk about it all. Are, are you guys in Edinburgh, Glasgow? Or... Glasgow, yeah. Glasgow, yeah. Glasgow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in Glasgow. So, yeah. But um, before, I guess before, you've, you've, you've answered this question, no doubt, a million times. But can you just t- tell us how you get started off in music? I think you started playing piano, was it six or four or something? Yeah, I started at four um, just by listening to the radio and uh, hearing my dad play, who uh, played piano. So we had one around. And he played, um, he was an amateur. He, 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 had, he was a storekeeper, basically. But he, uh, he also played piano. And he played... Um, kind of, uh, which I didn't realize till later on in life, but he played uh, kind of a New Orleans style stride piano and blues. 
So as a result of that, uh, I picked up some stuff from that, you know, in the, when I was a kid. And uh, I also got a lesson from a friend of his who was, uh, who lived in Winnipeg, Canada in Manitoba. And he came to visit my dad and he was a professional piano player. And he taught me my first uh, boogie woogie run when I was six, but I started at four. So it took, it took me from about six to 12 to get the boogie woogie run down because my hands were too small. <laughs> but that was where, you know, I started the uh, piano at four and then a guitar at eight. And then I had to relearn guitar at 12 because, um, because I came from such a small town in Canada, Estevan, Saskatchewan, which is just, just 10 miles north of the American border. Um, there weren't a lot of influences. So I, I only listened to radio for guitar and nobody to teach me. So uh, everything I do is pretty much by ear. But anyway, that, that's what, how I started and the age I was. So obviously when we talk about talk about you know moving way forward uh you know from being a four-year-old uh starting out in music and uh obviously joining queen in 1982 um that was obviously on the hot space tour um so how, yeah. did, how did how did that come about then how did that well i am not entirely sure uh <laughs> <laughs> i wish i could give you a real definitive answer but the reality <laughs> is uh um i had been playing with alice cooper's band uh, from 77, 78, 79, and 80. And I had written, uh, co-written an album with Alice and Davy Johnstone from uh, Edinburgh. Used to be yeah. to play in a band with uh, Billy Connolly. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, I knew Davy and, and Dee, and that's how I ended up in Elton's band. But uh, I wrote some stuff uh, for Alice, and uh, we recorded it with Roy Thomas Baker eventually. We started off with Todd Rundgren and we did a couple tunes with Todd and then we eventually ended up with uh, Roy Thomas Baker doing the whole record. So I became friends with Roy and I think it was either through him or through Roger Powell, who was the keyboard player, who may have been offered the gig, I'm not sure, but uh, one of those two guys, possibly Roy, recommended me and uh, I went to meet Jerry Stickles in LA who was uh, Queen's road manager. And I thought he was going to ask me to play. But when I got into the office, there was no keyboard or anything. And, he, and I said, well, don't you want to hear me play or anything? He said, no, I, uh, we know you can play. We just want to you know, make sure you can get along with the guys. So he would just basically want to make sure I wasn't an asshole. I think that was, <laughs> I think it was an asshole check. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and I guess I passed, which I don't know. I guess that's a good thing. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess I made it through the... Uh, through that test and then I didn't have much time and 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 I remember j asking Jerry what tunes we were going to do and he didn't really couldn't really tell me uh so I had a lot of tunes to learn I had a week to learn a new synthesizer because they were using a Roland Jupiter 8 and I I had been using an Oberheim before that that's just technical stuff so um I had to learn a new synthesizer in a week and a whole bunch of tunes I flew to Montreal on a Sunday night and played with them Wednesday night at the forum. So we had two days worth of rehearsal. And, uh, and John Deacon was playing guitar on some of these tunes. He was playing rhythm guitar instead of bass. So I was playing bass, uh, the synthesizer bass parts off of Hot Space. And those tunes were not easy because they were not symmetrical. They went A, B, A, C, A, B, A, half a C, B. You know, it was not yeah. symmetrical tunes like normal pop tunes sometimes. They were experimenting with some, you know, uh, some of the format. And uh, anyway, I somehow managed to memorize that. And uh, we played. And after the first rehearsal, they, they liked what I did. So that's when it all started at the Montreal Forum in, uh, in 82. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, of course, before, um, before you joined Queen, we, you know, Queen, were, Queen had Morgan Fisher doing the European dates. Um, do you know the reason why Morgan didn't continue with the rest of the, the date, the Japanese dates and the North American dates? Is that anything you know about? I don't know too much about that whole thing. Uh, when I joined, it was, I really didn't realize who had been playing beforehand. Sure. I wasn't yeah. aware of the history. Um, so I found those things out years later. Uh, and, you know, and uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, chronology was there. Sure. You mentioned the... Uh, you know, obviously joining the band and doing doing the first show. Um, and I think you you, you talked about um, speaking to Freddie and telling him that he might need to change his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might not have been the wisest move, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I came up with that myself. Um, 
yeah we were sitting in the room and everybody was happy because we had done a good rehearsal and they knew i could play the stuff so you know brian was happy we said that's just what we're looking for and it's great and so i was just joking around with freddie because i was sitting there thinking freddie mercury freddie mandel i said to him uh Freddie, two Freddies, Freddie M, Freddie M. I said, that's going to get confusing. I said, you're going to have to change your name, man. <laughs> and, uh, he started laughing, so we hit it off on a good foot. Fortunately, he started laughing. That could have gone in one of two ways. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could have failed the asshole test right there and then. Would have been the sec- I would have failed the second test. <laughs> um, do you remember how those dates, um, particularly the ones in the States, went? Um, given, you know, you've, you've, you've alluded to the fact that you weren't too aware of the, maybe the situation around Queen at that moment um, in time, but given that the Hot Space album was, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, that favourable in the States, what was the reaction with the audience? Did you feel that the audience was still very much with Queen, you know, on the gigs that you played or, you know? Yeah, I did actually, um, because they weren't just doing the hot space stuff. They did about three or I think we did back chat and uh, a couple of like two or three other numbers. But the whole set wasn't, you know, weighted down with hot space material. They still did a lot of the great classics and stuff. Um, So people were willing to check out the new stuff um, because they were getting a huge amount of the old stuff as well. Um, Primarily the, you know, their classic stuff. So, um, you know, when we did those tunes, we always got good reception on those too. It wasn't like the crowd disappeared. It was like, uh, I would say pretty even. So they did give them a chance on the new material. I mean, it was experimental stuff back then doing what they were doing. Um, in some ways they were a little bit ahead of the time and John had been influenced by the chic records, you know, um, Mm -hmm. uh, Bernard Edwards, the bass player. And uh, I think that's where he is influenced for another one bites the dust. Yeah. Uh, yeah, stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, um, it was it was fun. It was fun doing the tour, and the audiences were very receptive. Fantastic. Awesome. I mean, I think um, you know all of us um, are, are all in agreement that the the live versions of the Hot Space songs are, are far superior to what was yeah. on the albums. We just like the vibe of them live more than we do on on the album. So yeah, I mean, and I've got a I've got a live uh, bootleg on vinyl from Osaka. Um, oh yeah uh-huh. you know from that tour so uh, uh-huh. you know and, it, and it's a it's a great show you know and the, the body language was on there as well you know and body language and, yeah yeah so yeah no, well you know uh the first thing i noticed at the rehearsals is i learned the tunes at the uh at the speed of the record yeah. and i got on stage <laughs> and roger counted on one two three I'm like, holy <laughs> shit i uh <laughs> Kind of hold on to this horse because it's uh, galloping away. So uh, they were a little faster, but fortunately I had learned them well. But yeah, yeah, they were a little bit up. They're a little more rocky, I think, live than they were yeah. on the record, uh, where they were more, I guess, more discoy. Yeah. Um, but live, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun because John got a chance to play some rhythm guitar, which he liked doing. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so you you also played with the band on Saturday Night Live. Um, yeah which actually turned out to be Queen's last ever U.S. performance. Um, and we know that Freddie had vocal pro- you know, problems because he, you know, he, he, you know, he, he got into an argument the night before and shouted himself hoarse. Um, but given, given it was the U.S. again and given, given the previous situation that we mentioned, the Hot Space album, and given the, the, sort of, I guess, the handicap in Freddie uh, with his voice, did you feel that the band were trepidatious about going on going on live tv and and performing um and that did you you get a sense of that at all you know i think it was the first time that uh collectively we were all kind of nervous because it was uh you know everybody knew snl was a big show there yeah um and live and so it's not like really second chances you just go on and play (laughs) and i think we all felt a little little nervous but not in the sense it was you know debilitating just kind of uh, adrenaline you know make sure you play the right notes type of thing yeah um but i noticed freddie had a i thought he sounded great he had one little area where he his voice kind of flipped for a second but i thought he did a great job um and i thought the band was particularly on and i i I like both versions of the tunes we did um and we'd been playing quite a bit by by that point so we were pretty tight Mm -hmm. so i actually enjoyed it and i think the version of crazy little thing is a fun version because that was more the honky tonk version with the piano added Mm -hmm. you know um and then we did under pressure uh which i thought turned out pretty good so i think all in all it was a good 
a good performance. I had no idea, or they had no idea that it would be their last uh, television performance. I think that happened after the fact with the, uh, I guess it's a want to break free uh, video. Yeah. That that was a problem they wouldn't play in the States. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah it doesn't make much sense does it yeah no, but no. well i i've explained it before but i think what the problem was um i think i understood what was going on with that video because i was in canada and i understood yeah. seen coronation mm -hmm. street and all that yeah. stuff so yeah. i knew it was a, a, a you know a take off uh, take off on you know the british uh, soap operas yeah and uh particularly coronation street yeah. And for some reason, they didn't get it in the States. I mean, there's always been a tradition of that in British humor. I mean, the Rolling Stones were dressed up as uh, Royal uh, Navy uh, pilots, uh, women pilots on their one of their covers. <laughs> yes, uh, right. And, you know, yep. and there's Benny Hill and all the other guys, you know. Yeah. So that's nothing right. foreign to to that, you know, yeah. to the, the British <laughs> humor uh, thing. And, you know, I think we all got that, except that for some reason it didn't. Somebody at MTV, they didn't get it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think they sort of... Uh, wanted to pass on the video and queen was not decided not to go back for a while because you know they just weren't getting the proper uh respect i think it was that they deserved yeah it's an interesting one because i remember jim beach talking about this um about freddie in particular saying that he didn't want to go back to the states until they they had a hit a hit record and and jim would point out that well you need to kind of tour the states and then you'll get a hit record so you know it was a chicken and egg situation a little bit yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah 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 but that was interesting i think they were misunderstood and i think it just turned into uh it, it became larger than the actual initial problem yeah, yeah. i Absolutely. think that i think the the canadians and the british have like you said fred i think we have a very similar um sense of humor but like you know uh, and i think in america i've been to america i i play in a band as well and i've, I've played in america and there's a definite difference in humor yeah I, I, absolutely I feel, yeah yeah definitely. yeah no you know we had monty python years before it made it to the states yeah um and you know i used to watch benny hill all the time and all the you know the monty python benny hill uh you know just a you know uh the great british comedians and stuff you'd see those and uh you know, uh, Pink Panther, uh, you know, all the, all the stuff yeah. that uh, came from over there uh, always had that sort of absurdist type of thing. And uh, mm -hmm. plus the dressing up as women thing, taking the, taking the piss, you know? And uh, <laughs> yeah. so that was kind of understood, but I, I guess it was missed over here for some reason. I don't know. I think nowadays it might be a little more accepted. Yeah. I think in a yeah. lot of ways, I think th times have changed strangely enough, but mm -hmm. um I think it really emanated from MTV's view of, you know, what was acceptable and what wasn't. And I think they made yeah. a big mistake on that one. Yeah. So that yeah. was a funny video. I mean, it was yeah. just funny. Yes. Yeah, hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, um, Fred, at that early stage when you started working with Queen, um, did you add anything different into the mix that maybe wasn't there before on live songs? No, and, you know, I get that maybe you didn't have a frame of reference necessarily, but how much, I guess, so how much free reign were you given to do your, your own thing on, on the tracks? Well, uh, you mean live or in the studio? So this is li still live just when you're in a live. Live, live situation, yeah. Yeah, well, live, um, you know, I used to take over from some stuff, I think in Champions, I'd take over halfway through the tune on piano, on my piano. I had a piano back where I was situated, right beside John's setup. Um, and then I used to play, uh, we started turning a crazy little thing into a jam. I know they'd done a bit of that before, but um, I think we kind of enlarged it too because Freddie started dragging me out to play that on his grand piano. And uh, it turned to a whole thing with Freddie coming over and banging on the piano with me and stuff. And we, it was a lot more um, improvised and a lot freer for, for, you know, a longer time, I think, in that, in that song. Um, the other stuff I kind of stuck to, uh, most of the, you know, uh, record things that I could do because, uh, some of those songs are iconic and, you know, I didn't really want to change any parts or, or, you know, I felt it was my job to stick to the original blueprint. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how much you're aware of, this is just a, <laughs> maybe a bit of a silly question, I'm not sure, but um, I don't, don't know how much you're aware of the Flash Gordon soundtrack. 
it's something we we did a podcast on it and we really love the synth sounds and the synth work on it and given it was the band doing that themselves i just wondered if, if uh, you know what your opinion of it was you know uh, given that given that's your your expertise you know yeah i'm not too familiar with the soundtrack uh i've heard well we opened the show with flash uh but that yeah. was recorded it was uh-huh. recorded yeah uh so we did that and i knew they were capable of playing all that synth stuff because it played a lot of stuff on hot space all the yeah. synthesizer stuff and uh but um i'm really not too familiar with the flash soundtrack i haven't heard too much of it i've heard bits and things throughout the years but i didn't yeah. own it and uh i don't recall having to get it and i just it just kind of slipped under my uh radar yeah. that yeah. particular album but i know that those guys were all players uh, they all yeah. played keyboards you know mm-hmm. um particularly yeah. brian and freddie obviously um but since stuff they delved into too. So, I mean, I think they were pretty successful at all the things they accomplished and tried to do. Yeah. I uh, just don't know too much about Flash. Um, so your, your first recording session with a Queen member, I guess, was the Starfleet Project uh, with Eddie Van Halen, Phil Shane and, and Alan Grazer. Um, how much fun were those sessions? Um, or were you kind of rolling your eyes as Eddie and Brian traded solo after solo after solo? You just kind of, okay, right? <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I'm a guitar player too. So uh, yeah, I've been playing for years and I'm a, bit, a big fan of guitar players, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I would love to have been playing anything, you know, on those sessions. So I was happy to be there. But the joke I always used to say is that the, what are the two words you're not going to hear? Piano solo. But uh, <laughs> but actually, I did do a solo on one. Yeah, of you, did, you uh, did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we uh, they were a lot of fun. I mean, those sessions were a lot of fun. We did uh, a more commercial kind of thing with, uh, you know, Starfleet, where we had a, Brian had a complete arrangement. It was kind of a pop television arrangement, yeah. you know, from the TV series. Um, so we did that, and then we did a you know, let me out and blues, a couple of tunes, blues tunes where we were just basically jamming in the studio. And that's a lot of fun for musicians to go in without a, you know, you don't have to sit and read charts and you're not being coached by the producer or other people. You just get to go in and play, you know, blues. So that's whatever, yeah. that's the common denominator amongst most rock musicians when they meet. And if you don't know one another, let's just play a blues. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we had a lot of fun and a lot of camaraderie. And you sort of tell at the end of the, there's a picture of us all, everybody's smiling. So we had yeah. a great time. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, Eddie was playing great. Brian was playing great. They were kind of feeding off one another like guitar players do. So uh, it was a lot of fun and a lot of camaraderie in that session. I mean, we had a great time. And then, of course, after that, you go into the studio with Queen, um, um, and you're 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 heavily involved in, in on the Works album. Um, so you know, and being the first ever guest on a Queen album as well. Um, so the tracks you're involved in, I've, I know you know these tracks, but I'll just say it out loud for the listeners. Okay. <laughs> so obviously, it was Radio Gaga, Man on the Prowl, uh, Hammer to Fall, I Want to Break Free. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about those those tracks, um, sure. if, we, if we could. Um, first off, Radio Gaga, it, it's actually one of our favorite uh, favorite singles that Queen released. Um, I mean, we're all we're all heavy rock kind of metal guys ourselves, but but we love we love um, you know the full spectrum of Queen and Radio Gaga is certainly one of our fa- one of our favorites. So yeah. I just w- wanted to uh, ask what what was your involvement on that? Um, we particularly love the the synth work on it but it's just to find out what, what, what you did on it. Well, I can tell you pretty well what I did on that tune. Uh, I, there was three different studios, I believe, booked in the record plant in Los Angeles. Mm. So I went in with different guys into different studios to develop the tunes. Um, and as I recall, Roger had a framework for that, minus a few little things in the chorus and chords and stuff, which we added. But... Um, he had a guitar an acoustic guitar thing he played for me i think i think he was playing himself i'm not sure whether the demo i don't recall a demo i think he played it actually uh but the bass line was done with a and he had that down i believe a drum machine um and i went in and played uh i think i first played a synthesizer thing uh a kind of um no, I believe I played a piano thing. I played a piano bass, a basic thing, a basic track on piano for the whole tune. And then I went in and kind of doubled it with some uh, synthesizer stuff, uh, some pads and things. And then uh, I put some bells on there, you know, the higher bells, ding, 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 that kind of thing. Yeah. 
that's going to translate well on <laughs> we're going to be checking their ear earplugs uh, so i played that and uh then uh, the tune was pretty full at that point. And I mean, it was missing guitar and everything, but um, it didn't have a bass part on it. So I mean, because I play bass too, I put a temporary bass part on it um, that kind of tied it together because I wanted to just solidify it before I left the session. And uh, I think John may have used some of the ideas from those bass parts. Um, I know he used some of the 10th runs that I did, the inversions. Um, and then we went into another studio, I recall, uh, and Freddie sang uh, Radio Gaga, and I played a chord, and it went through a vocorder. So we vocorded Freddie's voice, so you hear the synthesizer talking, basically, you know, when you're Radio Gaga, that type of effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so we did that, and that was pretty much it. And then after the after the fact, uh, Brian put on his all his guitars, which tied everything together. And, uh, held the tune yeah. that was a glue i think was the guitars yeah i mean i think that especially in the middle section of that song with the, the arpeggiating synths and all the other bits and bits and bobs it's just yeah. it's just a fantastic it's, song yeah, it's amazing. And yeah. Really yeah you don't realize when you're putting it together sometimes until you hear the completed process because i wasn't there for the guitar overdubs so mm -hmm. i was really happy to hear what brian had done i mean it, yeah. you know tied everything together and uh, all the synth parts came together and mac is a great engineer and producer and he has a knack for, um, for you know, inserting the proper parts at the proper point and gluing them all together and, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, solidifying the arrangements with his, you know, his yeah. production uh, yeah. abilities, you know, which are pretty uh, high. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was fun working with those guys. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we've asked um, some of our listeners, um, uh, you know, for some of the points they wanted to bring up and, and, and sure. mention to you. Uh, um, and one of um, Owen, Owen Ling, who's actually a journalist himself, he, he's a fantastic writer. He writes for We Are Cult and many other, for many other sites. But I think you've kind of answered this, Fred, but I'll, I'll ask you in case there's anything particular. Uh, but Owen asked how much did the final version of Radio Gaga differ from, I guess, what you heard from Roger? Uh, how how different was it? Yeah, the final version from what you originally heard. Well, I mean, Roger had the, it was a framework. He had the whole yeah. tune as a framework. We just put in little things here and there to to cement chords and stuff, and different inversions. I used different inversions on the piano that that gave it certain, uh, you know, a, a different texture. And uh, I also put some, you know, uh, bells and things that were like I start yeah. was starting to use bells with. Um, with uh, some of the production stuff I was I was doing, and I I like the way those you know had little high melodies and things that, um, yeah. But um, so, it was, so it was very basic from Roger then. At the it was very right? basic, yeah. yeah. It was pretty basic, yeah. but the framework was all there. Yeah. The, and he had already put down, as I recall, the bass part. You know, the intro. Right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't play the the, the sequenced bass part. Yeah. Uh, that was the Rogers doing, I believe. Mm -hmm. Man on the prowl now. Um, the the rip roaring solo uh that you that you do on that one um the was was that was that just was that just an improvisation was that just just um press play on the tape and i'll just do this thing or did you did you did you do a few takes and work out an eventual final final uh, version of it i don't believe it being anything more than one take i mean the whole idea came from freddie it wasn't my idea to do this um freddie said and this, I think, is a good indication of his character. Uh, he said to me, uh, you know, he'd played it up to a certain point. He said, why don't you take over? You know, I like your rock and roll playing. We play all that wild stuff. And he said, and they'll, and they'll think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, where's, you know, I've got a little saying. I, I, say, I, I said, there's no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. <laughs> so, uh, I've been used to doing some sessions, so it wasn't a big deal for me to to play something in the middle. You know, I didn't think anything of it, and so I think I went in and did one take, and it's all kind of wild, and it ends with my kind of just fooling around on the piano, going down on yeah. this uh, kind of arpeggio, to, uh, improvised thing. It was all improvised. It was just some rock and roll stuff. But he knew that I played that stuff from jamming with me on stage with Crazy Little Thing. I think that's where he got you know. Um, so he. I did it. I didn't think anything about it, but he gave me specific credit on the uh, album for yeah. playing that part. So that says a lot about Freddie. 
yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic part. It's another another bit. Uh, it's another bit we discuss on the the, the works podcast. That's been one of the one of the mm-hmm. highlights of the song. You know. Um. It's it's it's. it's well, that's it's, nice. Yeah, I'm it's, glad. It's fantastic. I, I, you're never kind of aware <laughs> when you're doing it, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Hammer to Fall. I'm, I'm assuming this was more texture stuff on this one, given it's a straight up rocker and things like that. Yeah, I didn't play a lot on that. I, I refer to them as bleeps and blobs because they're just little, uh, it was my Jupiter with a little delay on it. And I think it only comes in in the second verse. I love that tune. I mean, it's a great rocker. I mean, that's a great tune. I'm happy to be a part of it. But uh, I, I, my participation, it was very minimal. I just played some little uh, textural things like you say uh, little re- repeating um, uh, double notes I believe just yeah. go through that the second verse and maybe a little later in the tune too but but I think it just helped change the uh, the texture a little bit as, as the verses came in and added something new mm-hmm. yeah fantastic and then I suppose I want to break free this is probably the song that you know maybe in a, a queen situation you're asked about the most um, <laughs> get, you know uh, given the famous solo on it um, so I didn't we, know it was for famous. I had no idea until several <laughs> years ago that it was supposedly famous until I turned on YouTube and there's a million guys playing that solo. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, I wasn't sure what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I mean, all three of us for many years and, and we're not alone in this thought that it was a guitar and it was through a, you know, a, a specific effect and, you know, um, especially given the, you know, obviously what you do in the synth with the pitch wheel and stuff and the bends and all that. So it's, it's, you know, it very much sounds like a guitar. So I guess what I wanted to just ask about that. Um, uh, did, did you purposely go for a guitar sound? Was that something John wanted or was it something that you thought, you know, I want to go with that? trying to recreate a guitar sound or? Well, um, there was no direction, as I recall. Uh, and John, I didn't know that there was, this was going to be a temporary thing or anything. I was just, I was unaware of anything other than, I think John and Mac had asked me, just, just can you play a solo here? And I talked to Mac recently. I forgot that I had played all the keyboards on that tune. I thought maybe John played some, I couldn't remember, but Mac said, no, you played everything on that tune. <laughs> so I, uh, I think I may have played all the stuff on the tune. And then I think they wanted a solo, which wasn't a big deal for me. I've been in done sessions before. Now I'm a guitar player. So when I, when I was in Toronto, I played with a uh, guitar player by the name of Dominique Troiano. I was in his band and we had two keyboard players and we used to solo back and forth. And back then they only had two, two uh, notes on a synthesizer that you could, you know, with a bender. So we were kind of limited. But I always thought, uh, you know, I, I was influenced by, I guess, Jan Hammer, who was playing with Jeff Beck. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Jeff Beck always referred to Jan Hammer as one of his favorite guitar players. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it was just a matter of, you know, because I play guitar, I thought it made a lot of sense to use the bender to kind of bend notes up like I would if I was, you know, trying to do a screaming solo on my telly or something. Um, and when I went in to do that session, uh, I just, I had that set for a, uh, I think it was a, a, a full tone, da, 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 that kind of bending. So I did the whole solo, just did it once. And I was thinking guitar when I was playing it. I wasn't trying to emulate a guitar player, but it just kind of slipped into my consciousness that that's how I felt like playing it. And it's very laid back. Uh, and then the last note, the whole solo was one take and the last note was punched because I wanted to do um, like a dive bomb. Uh, like, right. you, know, you know, if you had a you know, whammy <laughs> bar or something, yeah. uh, Floyd Rose or something, you take it down an octave. So I wasn't set up for an octave. So Mac, uh, uh, we talked about it and I punched in the last note, which goes down a whole octave. Yeah. And uh, that was an amazing punch because back then there was always, you know, slight delays when you were punching an analog tape. Very risky thing to do, but he was so skilled, you can't hear it at all. So that's mm-hmm. the whole thing. It was a one take. Uh, and a, and a punch and uh you know everybody can play that solo better than me because i only had to play it once i wasn't i had i wasn't touring with the band uh you know i think i was with elton's band by let's see we did 83 i know by 83 i wasn't but it was in between elton and uh super tramp and um you know that's how it how it came about it was pretty uh innocent little situation but but afterwards i found out that i was the first guy to play i wasn't even thinking about this stuff i, I was the first guy to play on the queen record and certainly yeah. the first to do a solo i believe but um you know i wasn't trying to do one instead of brian or something you know yeah. and mm-hmm. i mean i guess the 
to uh, summarize the whole political aspect, Brian and I are still friends. So, that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> but you know, look, I can elaborate on that. It's something funny happened to me years. I was in London playing with Elton and I went into some music store. This is after uh, I want to break free had come out and I was looking at this Roland synthesizer and it was a newer version of Juno or something after the Jupiter eight had been out for a while. This was their new synth. And I was just, you know, uh, going through the different patches that they have on there. And I came upon one that said maze sound. I thought, Oh, I played it. And it was the sound from, I want to break free. (laughs) Roland had thought that Brian had played a guitar solo on that track and copied it and put it on their synthesizer patch, which was in fact a a Roland patch. Yeah, Yeah. so they didn't, I don't think they realized. So (laughs) anyway, I thought it was a lot of humor and all that stuff, but uh, I still see guys playing that online, you know? Yeah. And some some of them play it better than I can play it. You know, I'd have to go and do a lot of rehearsing to figure that stupid guitar solo out. But that's the thing, it, it, it translates so well to guitar. You know, I know obviously that was in your thinking anyway, but when he, when you see Brian playing it live and it, it just, it seems like it, it belongs, you know, on on guitar, you know, you, you've actually done it that well. And and um, I think the melody of it's, it's, it's a, a, such a great melody for a, for a solo as well, you know? Well, yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I started off with trying to uh, start like, you know, like in uh, jazz or anything, blues and everything, you start off, kind of with a head, an introduction, a reiteration of the melody. And I sort of started doing it, you know, dun, 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 I want to break free, there's a melody there. And then improvising from that point onwards, but I wanted to establish a theme and then uh, improvise off the theme. So that's how I, 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 I approached it. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a question um, on the back. It's, it's, I think you might have answered that yet again, but um, we'll ask it anyway. But one of our listeners, Darren uh, Heliwell, he asked about Brian's reaction when he found out that he wasn't put that solo down. Yeah, uh, I mean, I wasn't there. I, they were out for dinner, and the only guys in the studio, I believe, was uh, Mac, uh, John, and myself. And I think Freddie may have shown up later, but I didn't see Brian that night. And I mean, we were already friends by this point, you know. Yeah. So I'd done Brian's record. We'd been on tour. We'd gone on. Uh, we'd hung out personally. So I had no in the you know indications of any political ramifications. It wasn't my intention to uh, enter Brian's sphere. You know, I mean, that was, he took care of all that stuff, soloing and everything. It was just that John had asked me, uh, can you play a solo on this? I said, yeah, sure. It wasn't even, you know, what, I didn't stop and think, well, you know, you know, it's not Winston Churchill uh, deliberating, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I just went and did a stupid solo and I didn't have any ideas that this was going to be uh, an issue <laughs> so, and I didn't want anything to come between me and Brian and his friends yeah. we've seen, we've discussed this and he plays the hell out of it live you know so yeah. uh, it was just a thing that happened and John wanted it on the song I guess a, a different you know different texture than a, a guitar solo so hey yeah. I'm a guitar player I'd rather hear Brian play the solo you know <laughs> yeah. I have no I have no uh you know it's kind of a weird thing because I was I'm a basically a rock and roll piano player and a guitar player and you know play b3 or two but so um, I'm definitely a fan of the guitar world, you know, and yeah. I played guitar with Alice Cooper the last year. I switched to lead guitar and stuff. And so I, I'm not, uh, I'm not in competition with guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, so you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned Elton um, um, earlier and you, you played Live Aid with, with Elton, uh, Elton John. Yeah. Or, um, um, could could you describe the experience of that playing playing Live Aid? I mean, I know the significance of it. Maybe at the time, it's you know you don't necessarily know what you what you're actually what the significance of it is. But um, you know, even looking back on it now, I mean, what was what was it like for you? <clears throat> well, I, I've mentioned it before actually, but um, one of the things that made it easier to do is that uh, in '84 we toured pretty hard uh, with Elton Span. I think we did ten month touring. And one of the gigs was Wembley Stadium. And I think we did a, it's called the uh, afternoon evening uh, concert. It was when Elton was kind of in his um, straw hat period. Um, boater, I guess it would be. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm still standing and all that. Yeah, I'm still standing yeah. right after yeah. that, all that stuff. And we did a concert yeah. there and it was packed. And it was like 80, 90,000 or something. It looked like maybe 70. I don't know. It was full. So we had already done, uh, you know, 
to our to to our concert by ourselves at Wembley. So when we went back to do Live Aid, it wasn't as if it was in, as intimidating because I had already stood in front of the crowd uh, of that size there. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, somewhat nervousness because it was being, you know, Bob Geldof was running it like a military operation, you know. Uh, I think you had th like 35 minutes ahead of time to get into your trailer. They had four trailers set up and you would go in and change uh, before the gig and then you had like 30 minutes afterwards to get out of your clothes and get the hell out of there and when we were in these little I guess they're called caravans over there but little trailers there were four of them set up there was Queen and then next was Elton I think it was Bowie and then the Who um, so we were all side by side you know between one another so uh, you know we did our thing got changed went on and played and we went on after Queen so I went over to their little trailer and told them you know what a great job that sounded great to me i saw a little bit of their set but we were getting ready for ours i think we were coming on not that long afterwards so um but you know there was a sense of uh something special going on here because there were so many people in the audience and you know it was like a billion or more watching as well yeah so um we had a lot of fun but it was uh it was kind of quick and it was kind of disorienting because I wasn't using uh, my exact setup and I had to stand up, which I don't like doing when I'm playing, but uh, it was just, you know, take it or leave it type of thing. We had to get this done. And I think Geldof did a great job getting the whole thing uh, organized. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you, you, you played, you, you played the uh, guitar with Elton at, some, at, at, at points, didn't you as well? Fred? Yeah. I used to play, um, I think I played bitch uh, with him. I used to do a solo on that and, uh, uh, I played a solo on a Sleeping With The Past record, and it was called Stone's Throw From Hurting. It was kind of a blues solo, and I used to play that live sometimes. Yeah. And then I used to play on Saturday Night, It's All Right For Fighting. And I think in Australia, I played on Madman Across The Water. I think I played guitar on that, too. You know, Davey was yeah. obviously the main guitar player from that band, but but we used to have a lot of fun jamming and stuff on stage. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I want to talk about Mr. Bad Guy just now. So... Um, I remember Roger saying that when he would go to do some backing vocals on the album, you know, it would maybe come the second time and he came back over to Munich and he felt that they were no further forward than they were when he came initially. They thought it was, it was a bit sluggish, the process. I just wanted to find out how organised you found it when you went to lay down down your tracks because I'm right in saying it was fooling around and living on, living on my own. Was that is that correct, Fred? Yeah, I think uh, there might have been another tune, but I, we did a thing. Uh, she grows, she blows hot and cold. Oh yeah, yeah. Too, which which yeah. turned out to be a jam, and I actually got credit on that as a co-writer, which I was not looking for. But Mac pointed out that uh, you know he he basically wrote, wrote some of that stuff in the studio, so that I was fortunate that he gave me some credit on that. But um, I went over. I was with Elton at the time, I believe, and I went to Munich for a couple of days, and uh, it was just me and freddie and then mac in the studio as i recall and then for some of the live stuff i think for she blows hot and cold i think uh they had kurt kress on drums i think it was just kurt uh, myself drums piano and uh freddie when we were doing all this jamming stuff um but for the hot space I mean, for the hot space for the uh freddie mercury thing um mr bad guy uh i played some guitar on fooling around too i had this idea for um kind of an r&b uh like an american r&b uh picking part you might hear it underneath on them and, and i played that on, on fooling around and i think i did, did some so some the solo on that tune too on a synth which was doubled by a guitar they had a guitar player there who sounded a lot like brian may yeah uh, yeah, those, yeah yeah uh he did a great job um but we didn't do our stuff at the same time he came in after the fact um and then i recall um playing song that kind of almost a jazz oriented modal uh solo on live it on my own uh which has been you know uh, i think been several remakes and uh uh kind of disco versions of that but uh or remixes yeah. but um we were working and you know freddie was in a good mood and i we all went out for dinner and uh we had a good time there but i was there for a pretty short time as well i think it's only two or three days yeah I mean, you talked about the solo that you, you put down on Living On My Own. Um, the, the solo really reminds me of 
Mike Garson stuff on Aladdin saying that kind of that kind of really jazz stuff that you mentioned. It's that's uh, my favorite part of the song actually is the, is the <laughs> piano part. Um, you know, it, well, fortunately, I have very low rates for uh, compliments today, so I'll <laughs> give you an address where you can send the check. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you know, um, it's I, I love the I love the chords, just the big stabby chords. You know, before you actually go into you know the, the more kind of arpeggiated stuff, or you know, your fingers start moving around a little bit. Uh, it's just yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's it's great stuff. But um, I think Paul had a question around about filling. Yeah, Phil, and I, I think you've already kind of covered it, actually. Um, with, uh, the, the, you mentioned the solo on filling around, and you said yeah. you, you did it on guitar, but you backed it up with uh, the on synth, because I was wondering if it was a, a similar thing to I Want to Break Free, and it was all synth that you'd done on the solo. Well, what actually happened, uh, what did you call it? Yeah, no, what happened was I played, uh, fooling around, I played some rhythm guitar on that, just some... Uh, some shots, think little things like that you hear throughout, and yeah, then you hear yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I played that, and then I did the solo on synthesizer. Oh yeah, I did the solo on synthesizer, and the guitar player, whose name escapes me unfortunately, uh, he doubled it. He played as well on top of the solo that I had done, I and see. and that was like kind of a one take solo too. Um, so he, uh, yeah, it was the it was Freddie's guitar player that actually yeah, that, doubled it, that solo. Is it Paul Vincent? Was that yeah, Paul, Vincent. Paul Vincent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, one of our list, one of our listeners, Fred um, Richard Hearn, he um, wanted to ask, do you think Freddie enjoyed not having the others around in the studio, just just it being his own thing? I think so because it allowed him to uh, to experiment in different areas than the band. You know, when you're in a band uh, as you know, you well know you have to make compromises. Not everybody gets their own way all the time. And you have to, you know, musical tastes have to be, you know, moderated. And so I think this just gives him a chance to do, uh, gave him a chance to do whatever he wanted to do. And I think that's, uh, you know, for an artist, that's a very, you know, valid uh, thing to do. So I think he was enjoying uh, what we were doing. And uh, I certainly got that feeling from him, you know. Yeah. Can I just ask Fred, um, Going yeah. back to going back to Freddie, um, obviously you know Freddie being a piano player as well as yourself, it was just to see if you could give us a little bit of insight and in, into what you know the differences between well between you and Freddie as pianists. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, what, what did you think of his skills, and and do you think he brought anything unique to the to the piano playing? Yeah, I think he was a great piano player for what he did. You know, I and I'm not saying I'm not. Uh, qualifying that but I thought he was a great player I mean his playing is extremely solid not many people realize how difficult that is to play those that stuff perfectly every night and he did that I never heard Freddie make a clink nothing uh, those aren't easy tunes uh, he had a classical oriented approach um, when he's starting out you know Bohemian Rhapsody or Bow Rap as it was called on the set list um, he's crossing his hands and doing mm -hmm. you know doing some things which are classically oriented playing parts and uh just what he played was always appropriate you know i think that the two of us respected one another because i was more i was more of a rock and roll type of player you know i i, I was closer to you know little richard and and i had some of elton influences in me plus jazz stuff that i played when i was younger i'm not really a a proper jazz player but i can fake my way around it to make people who don't know as much about jazz think oh he can play jazz when in actual <laughs> fact i don't i wouldn't take a jazz recording session if he paid me you know um i'm just not in i'm not qualified to do that really i can fake around, i can play certain things you know but um i i think that the two of us had uh complementary styles and we didn't get any of each other's way so yeah. i think that we respected one another and i think that's why he liked me my rock and roll playing. I think he may have recommended me to Elton in some ways because oh, cool. those two were friends. And I know Queen and Elton met. It was a weird thing. But we were, I was with Queen and I'd known all the guys in Elton's band because Davey and D and I had played with Alice Cooper's band for, you know, and I was friends with D and Davey for six years before I ever got in the Elton band. But Queen was in Washington and Elton was in Washington. And this is in like 1982 tour. 
and that uh, Elton invited us down to his room for, you know, just to get together and tea in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so we were all talking there and Freddie and, and, and uh, Elton were talking. So there was a connection there. So I, I, I think that Elton, you know, may have been influenced by Freddie explaining my piano part, playing to him. If he, if he asked anybody about my playing, then he would have told them, you know, I play like this. So it was, might've been a connection there, but as far as the, as a pianist, Freddie was a superb player, immaculate player. All those parts are, are difficult you know, and, and they're the right thing to play. Um, he was an integral part of their sound. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have sounded right if a session player had come in and played those different things, you know. Yep. Freddie had a certain um, uh, flair for, for that kind of thing. And it was his personality. There's a personality coming off those parts. That Absolutely. You, you can't get from just anybody. And that's what people don't understand when they think, oh, I'll just play, a, you can just replace anybody in a band. They don't understand the chemistry amongst the people and what is being emoted by the instrument, which is a, that X factor that people hear and feel and can't really, uh, they don't know why, but if it's missing, you know, it's gone. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And he had that, uh, he had a really great flair for piano. Plus it, it was all intertwined with, those incredible vocal parts yeah. that he was singing mm. at the same time. Awesome. Now, either one of those would be challenging to do, but to have them both synchronized, is, you know, yeah. the guy was a major musician, a major force. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Fred, I wanted to sort of talk about some of the other, again, the other music that you've been involved in. And uh, of course you've, you've played on the wall. Pink Floyd's The Wall, uh, very another absolute <laughs> <I did>. classic, <laughs> another absolute classic album. Um, again, another one of our favorite albums as well. So absolutely, um, yeah. was that was that due to working with Bob Ezrin um, with Alice Cooper? Was that how that came about? Did Bob give you a call on that one, or how did that come about? Well, I had worked with Bob in Toronto. That's where I first met Bob when I was with uh, Dominic Triano, who was a uh, guitar player from Toronto. He ended up, Donnie, Donnie ended up in the band called Guess Who out of Toronto, out of Winnipeg. And uh, he also took over for Joe Walsh when, in the James Gang when Joe left. Oh, ah, okay. Mm. So John, Donnie had been playing in LA with some, he'd done a couple of records of his own. And he did his solo record in, uh, in, you know, from Toronto. We went to New York and cut that. Anyway, we were coming in to do Dick Wagner's record and, uh, Dick, Dick was Alice Cooper's uh, musical director and a great writer and singer himself and guitar player extraordinaire. Him and Steve Hunter were the two guitar players with the Alice Cooper band. Yeah. And um, so I was called in to play on that session and that's where I met um, Bob Ezrin. And uh, after I'd played with Alice for a while, uh, I was with Alice for about four years and I was talking to Bob on the phone about something one day. It was unrelated to... Uh, to Pink Floyd or it was just I can't even remember the topic but uh he asked me if I could play B3 organ and I I said yeah of course <laughs> sure, no problem <laughs> I really hadn't played B3 for years and uh, my friend Dave Tyson we were a kind of a keyboard partner in Dominic Triano's band and he took care of the B3 stuff and synthesizer and I took care of you know Fender Rhodes clavinet and synthesizer so we had our duties but he was the B3 player and Toronto has a lot of great B3 players where I come from. So I did know some basics from it. Uh, but I really wasn't sure how to turn the instrument on when I went to that session. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately, it was on when I got in the studio. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, 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 I'd seen Gilmore and uh, Waters play before and Pink Floyd. But I'd seen Pink Floyd twice, but I wasn't, I wasn't the kind of fan that knew everybody's name. I'd just gone to see them like I was going to see everybody. And I didn't know them individually. I didn't even know their names. Yeah. So uh, I didn't really know who David Gilmore or Roger Waters were when I walked into the studio, other than they were in the band, you know. So um, I walked in and I played on a couple tunes and uh, in the flesh and the show. And then I had Chinese food with Gilmore and then I went home. <laughs> <laughs> and then I read books later on that I played on every track on the record. And, you know, I was, uh, <laughs> so I, I really didn't. I played on two tracks on the wall. So, you know. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, because that, that's, it, it was something that I only found out in recent years, uh, Fred, that, that it was you on, on, on the wall, and you know, it's particularly in the flesh, because you hear it really prominently, the, you know, the organ in the background, you know, and then mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, it's really, it's really up there. Um, well, it's a, you know, dirty, dirty rock and roll organ sound, you know, yeah. it's just full out, mm -hmm. you know, the, the gas pedals on 10 on that <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. 
So was it was it just you and Bob in the studio, or, or was 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 Dave and, and Roger there, or was it just you and Bob that? that, that was no, it was uh, all three guys were there. It was Gilmore, Waters, uh, Bob, right. Ezrin, and an engineer, I believe. Right. Yeah. And we were in a producer's workshop, which is um, off of Hollywood Boulevard. I'd never been there before. But I went over to the place, and they were kind of sitting on one of the dumpsters outside, you know, the guy, Waters and Gilmore, and talking and stuff. So, uh, and I just went in and uh, saw Bob, said hello, and they just asked me, told me about the part, and uh, put on my headphones and started playing. Um, and Waters, they asked me to do some really crazy stuff on the keyboard towards the end of, uh, I think it was in the flash or the show. I can't remember which one it was, but I was flapping all over the place and doing slides and everything. And they liked that and kept it, I believe. So um, it was a pretty fast session. Uh, I remember one of the things I did is I, when I walked in being a guitar player, I noticed David Gilmore's guitar was sitting there. So I was sitting in a little different area near the organ. And before I even started playing, we were just talking. I was talking to Gilmore. And I said, hey, so I was looking at his Stratocaster. I said, it's all right if I take a look at this and pick it up. He said, oh, yeah, sure. So I picked up his guitar and I started playing, you know, noodling around on it and i'm just looking at the guitar and playing a couple licks and things and then i turn it over and i look at the serial numbers it says zero 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 one. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the yeah. hell am i holding here if i drop this you know i'll be paying david for the rest of my life so i said okay thank you very much i put it back on the yeah. stand i think i've had it i think i've got a good feel for this thing and now I'll go play the organ <laughs> <laughs> just, just just to intersect a little question there, uh, Fred, uh, did you ever, ever have a go on um, Brian's guitar at all? Yeah. Strangely enough, I've played a lot of famous guitar players' guitars. I don't know why. But uh, I did, yeah, I, I, I gave Brian's go uh, with his 12 AC30s behind me. And that'll awesome. give you a night. That'll get your hair moving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there was no shortage of guitar on that stage. It's not like, hey, I need a little more, you know, I need a little more uh, guitar on my side of the stage because, <laughs> I mean, all that stuff was, uh, you know, you could hear everything. And uh, the guitar was great, very light strings. I think he was using eights at the time. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I mean, Jeff Beck played Brian's guitar and he sounded like Jeff Beck. So it's, you know. Yeah, it's in the fingers. It's in the fingers, yeah. Yeah. Um, I played Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar. Um, we were both at the same hotel in... Uh, in New York, uh, we were both going to possibly do a Bowie thing. We both of us did not end up doing it. Um, but I went over that. I was hanging out with Stevie for a few days and uh, I was up in his room one day. We were just talking and I said, uh, can I try your guitar? It was the one with this SRV on it. It looks like yeah. somebody bought it, at, you know, uh, Home Depot place or something. Just, <laughs> it's like a house sign, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I went and tried his guitar and I'd been playing for a lot of years by then. And uh, I went to play and I Oh, holy cow i can't these i can't bend these strings yeah huge hey, huge yeah. huge gauge strings yeah. 13 yeah. to 56 yeah 13 to 56 on there That's and i mean you know i could play it i could bend them but i mean it's not something yeah. that it would be pleasurable quite, quite a high action as well i think wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it was not low it was not low yeah um uh, but he'd been playing for a long time and to build up those muscles. But yeah, it was a, probably the, strangely enough, I, it was the opposite end of Brian's guitar, which was low action and very smooth strings, low, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I prefer that. Like BB yeah. King, King said, you know, why make it difficult? You know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. But uh, I played that guitar and I think, uh, who else did I, I uh, you know, well, I played my friend Philip Says' guitar, and he's a buddy of mm. mine. Yeah, he's got kind of tight. He used to have 13 to 56, too. Yeah. Great, great uh, player. Great player. I think Philip is the, I'm going to say he's the best blues rock player in the world. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Uh, certainly at the I, moment, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great guy. And I've done a lot of records with him and live, a lot of live stuff with Philip. Um, I consider yeah. him a good friend. And uh, I just, I hope he gets a little more notoriety because that guy is a, badass player yeah i was i was watching um you guys on youtube uh it was a new year's eve show in Ma oh, yeah. Ma maui or something like that oh the maui uh, sugar mill yeah 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 and then uh, I, I i got kind of sad because i was just looking at it and i was thinking wouldn't it be great to go down to a bar and sit and watch a band play you know <laughs> yeah I can't, I can't do that at the moment you know no, uh, it's it's uh, it's a really uh, I mean you know, 
it's one thing playing stadiums and all that other stuff. That's a lot of fun. But I mean, really, the when you're knocking it out, the the bars are the the real yeah. litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. For getting your chops together. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that something that you you think you'll you'll do once you know things get back to normal? You'll just you know play a play a few low key gigs and. Well, yeah, I'm not looking for a lot of touring things anymore. I mean, I might do something if something came along, but I'm not. Uh, um, I, I, I'm basically trying to get a record out of my own, a solo album. Yep. And uh, I'm close, but I've got some things that I have to deal with next week, uh, just from the technical aspect, legal things, and how, how to structure stuff and how to get paid and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a trio that I've been playing with um, before all this started, and we were just starting to get together. You know, we were working up repertoire um, from this album. And then this hit, so uh, it kind of dashed all our uh, plans. But I'd like to do that again. And I, I, I was playing with Philip, you know, that was kind of a fun gig that I did with Philip. I was left hand bass, which I've also done throughout the years, but I didn't have enough. You can't hear it very well on the, on the recording because it just didn't pick up the bass, but I was mm. blasting away. It just wasn't loud enough. <laughs> Philip, was, yeah. Philip was, how should I yeah, put this loud? He, play, he plays loud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's loud and fast and uh, you know, you got to hang on to that train or you're going to be left at the <laughs> <Yeah>. station. <laughs> but uh yeah, uh, I'd like to do something, but, you know, hopefully everybody will be able to get out and play at some yeah. point. We'll just have to see where yeah. this thing goes, and hopefully we'll develop some sort of herd immunity, and then people will be able to go and socialize again. Yeah, yeah indeed. So, indeed. You, you, can, you can bring the boys over to Glasgow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a few drinks, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, Saturday night's all right for fighting. No, <laughs> right. I, I, every night's okay for fighting in Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's like Toronto. I, I told my wife, you know, it's like in Toronto, yeah, when we were playing, when I was playing, you know, paying my dues and playing really crappy little play, places, we'd play six nights a week in a matinee on Saturday and we'd stay in the hotel and they were dumps, you know, a lot of these places yeah. where I first started out. Uh, in the winter and you know there was a, no bathroom in in your room and you had to walk down the hall and they had a rope tied to the wall for <laughs> your fire escape <laughs> uh, but you know i used to say like in canada you know uh on saturday nights or whatever when you're in your bar and everybody there's a lot of drunks and stuff there you, it only takes something like you know what are you looking at yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. What are you looking at? And that's that's it. I think you know? I think I think that might have something to do with a lot of Scottish immigrants being in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of my favorite favorite memories has been in Toronto and on King Street in one of the blues bars, and just sitting mm -hmm. sitting with a picture with uh, my now wife, and just you know sitting listening to the band, sitting in and and playing, and obviously people just get up and taking sitting behind the kit and taking the guitars and just you know it was just, just such a great vibe you know one of my favorite memories you know yeah well toronto uh i mean toronto in the 60s well, I, I didn't get to toronto till uh the 60s um and by then it had a really thriving music scene r&b you know uh and the guys that made it out of there like neil young and rick you know, rick james used to come up and play in toronto with neil young in a band called the minor birds yeah um, and then there was Steppenwolf came out of Toronto and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of great artists, Joni Mitchell, well, she was playing in Toronto, but, but for bands, there were a lot of really tough R and B rock bands in the city. So you heard a lot of that stuff, you know, and, uh, there was a great scene for, for bands to play. And, it, you know, I, I think that the orbit room was one of the last places left where they're having R and B and stuff there, but. It's. I don't think the same places are there anymore. But we, there were a lot of great clubs, and I know Philip Sace used to play at a place called Grossman's, and there were a lot of great, you know, places around the city that you could play. Yeah. But uh, those days are are gone now, you know. And then now it's sort of pay to play in Los Angeles, you know, kind of crazy, uh, you know. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, it, it seems to be as well. I find that a lot of. Um, technical music came from Canada, especially in the rock stroke kind of metal world that, that we kind of, the three of us are kind of into. seems that Canada is a real breeding ground for like virtuosity. Do, do you find that yourself? Yeah, I think so because uh, yeah, you had to have, I, I don't know why, but you had to have, have your chops together because I was kind of playing with Donnie. It was not a, it was a rock fusion band. We were kind of 
we were produced by the Brecker brothers and uh, well, one of them in uh, New York when we did a record for Capitol. But yeah, you were playing kind of fusion, you know, uh, mm -hmm. high speed stuff. Um, it wasn't exactly metal, but yeah. you know, R Rush came out of the same, yeah, the neighborhood. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. Getty and yeah. all those guys and Alex yeah. and uh, yeah, the other ridiculous musicians. <laughs> yeah, great players. And then Saga came out of there and they ended up being pretty huge in, in Germany. Um, and Triumph was out of Toronto. Triumph, uh, yeah, yeah. So there, uh, and, and Anvil, I guess those guys were out of there. No, they came out of Toronto, uh, you know. Um, but there were a lot of great players yeah. up there. I mean, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. some of the best B3 players I've heard are, you know. But, you know, I mean, I, I've been a fan of, I was sort of started out in what I guess was heavy metal, like ACDC was opening for us when I was playing with Alice, you know, so those yeah. were pretty heavy metal gigs back in the you know seventies. Yeah. Yeah. And strangely enough, I ended up playing with Anthrax. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> years ago. Yeah. So I was friends with Scott and, uh, and those guys who are, who are actually really great players. I mean, you wouldn't yeah. know that they could play, they can play classic rock as we, we did a cover of uh, smoking by Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh did that and then we did the kansas tune on, on record and i went and played the kansas tune with them live which was carry on wayward son um but those guys can play anything they're really great yeah. players yeah yeah i they're a little loud too uh <laughs> yeah I'll tell you a short story about that but i got on stage to do the soundtrack in the afternoon uh and i had my monitor set up behind me i was playing keyboards and we were doing carry on wayward son so I had everything pretty rocking. I did the sound check, you know, like before we started playing, I had all my keyboards up pretty loud and they were nicely set up behind me. I had my piano up loud and my organ loud, just enough so that I could not blast my ears out, but I could, you know, it felt mm -hmm. good. And so they counted in the two and one, two, three, and da, 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 and I couldn't hear anything. Not a one <laughs> beep of my keyboards. It was like, I had to stop the whole band. They had to raise them about 40 dB so that I could now hear what I was playing. But they're loud. That's a loud band. We, uh, my, my, my band supported Anthrax um, about, what, 16 years ago or something? Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, back back then. And uh, yeah, I can I remember like standing at the side of the stage and being like my, my eyebrows were like blown back. It was, <laughs> it was just Yeah, like... they're pretty loud. Well, Scott, well, Scott's now using those 5150 amp, yeah, yeah, inhaling yeah, amps, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great amps, yeah. He's a monster rhythm guitar player, but especially yeah. for metal, he's like unbelievably tight very tight yeah and it's really hard and it's an art form that people people don't realize rhythm guitar is a, an art form that is oh, not you know like malcolm from uh, acdc and yeah, all the other guys. yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. he's the master. i used to go i used to go catch those guys before alice's set because they were on before us so i used to go yeah. one of the road crew said to me hey you could check this band out there's a guy that got, he gets on the on the uh shoulders of a roadie and goes out into the audiences and it was you know it was angus and uh yeah I used to watch those guys and we'd say hello to them. We didn't become real tight because I didn't know them, but I, yeah. you know, we were, we were hanging out a little bit after the gigs, but they were opening up for Alice. So those are pretty heavy metal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Die, I bet. <laughs> um, well, we have a question from one of our colleagues actually in podcasting. Um, Rye is his name. He's a Canadian. Um, yeah. And he does a podcast on black Sabbath um, called Sabbath bloody podcast. Um, he, had a question about working with Alice. So um, in particular, the um, Flush the Fashion album. Um, and he's asking um, how much Alice directed you in the album. I know you said you were the musical director, so maybe it was the other way around. But what he said, it was a kind of new wave vibe to the album. So um, he wondered how contrived that was. Was it a direction that was deliberately kind of sought, I guess, on that album? You know, uh, that's an interesting question because it wasn't, contrived at all to be i didn't i wrote a lot of i switched to guitar for that tour because uh i had written a lot of stuff on guitar and i thought what's the point of playing it on the piano stuff because most of it i played on on that album there's davy and i davy johnson and i were playing guitar double guitar you know he's playing Les paul i was playing my strat which i'd bought from alice um <clears throat> 1960 strat in perfect condition which strangely enough i sold several years later like an idiot uh -huh. um <laughs> Yeah, if we could get back some of the, that gear. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I just decided to switch to guitar. And I had written a lot of the stuff to be less. I wasn't thinking new wave when I wrote that stuff. Somehow it turned out that way. And some, but I was trying to do some heavy like rock stuff, you know, um, 
like nuclear infected and some of the other things, they were, it came out differently when, uh, I think what happened is we did a song called clones and that was almost like Gary Newman in cars. Yeah. And I don't yeah. remember that too. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it turned out that way. I was now playing synthesizer stuff, you know, kind of the signature lines on that and stuff. And it just turned out to be in, influenced by the era that we were in Absolutely. and came out a little more new wave than I had envisioned. So, um, you know, I mean, some people, have, it's strange because some people now like that album, but um, at the time I was going from personally a more rock feel and it ended up somehow ending, you know, I, well, Roy was had produced the cars before that. So, yeah. and they had been in that studio. So we were, there was sort of a carryover of some sort, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a little more new wave than I personally had thought it was going to go. It just sort of drifted that way. And then when I listened to the thing and it, in full it was it was less of a rock thing than i wanted personally but there's still you know we got we covered that tune pain and alice is still still playing that in his live sets yeah i mean it's um i mean clones i mean the the the, the key the synth riff on clones is, is fantastic it's I, I love it you know it's yeah it's, it's an old uh it's an Ob 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 oberheim four voice synthesizer yeah. that yeah. i used to have to hit with my shoe to keep in tune <laughs> uh, it was, and the nice thing about it was is uh, four oscillators you know there were four separate modules on that thing and they were all slightly out of tune with one another and you got this huge fat sound out of it which is like uh, you hear on the clones Do -do 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 -do. Yeah. you hear it on that riff but yeah i mean it just wasn't uh i i think i was the first one of the first guys to add benders to the oberheim line because i i couldn't bend notes like i could on my korg baxi korg a few years earlier so I spoke to one of the guys that, uh, and he made a special box that connected to my synthesizer with Alice that allowed me to bend notes. And later they implemented that as part of the uh, the next Oberheim series. So they had a bender yeah. for you awesome. know, vibrato and, you know. Fantastic. Well, well, Rye himself called you a, a Canadian music legend. So that was, that was his words. And I think yeah, we'll I know, so like, oh, that's yeah. like, a, like a hockey player. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know there are anymore, you know, yeah. that's a nice um, thing to say. <laughs> but he was very, he was very excited. The fact that we were, were speaking to you. So, um, so oh, that's nice. So thanks to Rai for the, for the question. I think that was yeah, thanks Rai. Um, uh, just sort of coming back to Elton just a little bit, but um, a few more questions, um, if you don't mind, uh, sure. uh, before we finish up, Fred. Um, you, you played with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, didn't you, on, a, on one of Elton's live albums? How, how was that experience playing with an orchestra? Was that the first time, or had you played with orchestras before that? No, we had, we'd we never played with an orchestra. But I, I, I think Elton, I'm not sure if he had or not, but this was, uh, since I was in the band, we'd never done anything like that. Um, it was the first time that we'd uh, we'd played with an orchestra, and there was some. We heard there was some resistance. You know, maybe going to the one of the players in the orchestra was not sure about playing with us. So it was like two animals approaching one another in the woods when we first got together. Yeah. <laughs> By the end of the tour, they were wearing Elton glasses and standing up and starting the intro to Saturday Night Live. Because <laughs> <laughs> see, the thing with those guys is that. Elton's organization, they were coming from like a government, you know, if you wanted a chair moved, you have to make a requisition form out and then three months later it'd get done. With us, us, it's just, you know, the crew would just, okay, this is done here. You want this here? Okay, here it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was interesting from that aspect. They, they realized how free this was and that the rock and roll guys, I think they realized we could play too. You know, it was a different skill set, but um, you know, I, I think it, it kind of impressed some of the classical musicians that, Hey, the crowd's, plotting for these guys too and then you know we've pretty powerful sound coming off the stage and it's not just the orchestra so i think that some of those people changed their minds about working with classical musicians and i heard after the fact that uh working with us um and i heard after the fact that they really missed uh they had a great time on the tour and they missed us when we left and you know they had to go back to their their stuff but uh, i think they enjoyed doing it and i think it set it up for them to do some other uh tours there yeah. but they were all great players and Gus Dudgeon, who was uh, Elton's producer, and Clive Franks, who was the out front mixer, they devised uh, a method and microphone system of being able to mic all those instruments because it was an 88 piece. So they had to yeah. do a lot of uh, yeah. strategic uh, miking to get everything heard. And we had uh, James Newton Howard conducting, who was a, a formerly did what I did in the band, he was a keyboard player with Elton. And he's now, you know, a brilliant movie composer, but he was a very schooled guy and he was able to take Paul, Buck, Paul Buckmaster's 
arrangements and uh, translate them for an 88 piece orchestra. Yeah. And it was really an incredible uh, event and a, very powerful. We had a great time. We did, I think we recorded 12, I think we did 12 nights in Sydney uh, and recorded some wow. of those. Wow. Some, a lot of fun though, that uh, I didn't use many of my string samples on that tour, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> they've, got that, they've got that covered. <laughs> yeah, they had that covered. Um, I heard you mentioning in an interview that you don't consider yourself a session musician. Now, is that because when you're working with bands, you're in the band, you're actually con contributing to the writing process and, and, and as opposed to here, play this, is, it, is that how you see it? Yeah, in some ways, well, I, it, it gets fairly complicated, that whole concept. But I mean, I do do sessions and I've done a lot of them, yeah. but I wasn't like an A-list first call studio player, you know. Um, that's not what I was aiming for because where I came from when I was a kid, that, that, that I mean, you know, you grow up in Hollywood, that's an option. But where I grew up, that that didn't even enter my consciousness. And, and uh, really, the first record I did that was significant was in New York with uh, with Dominic Troiano, a record called Burning at the Stake. And we came down there, myself and Dave Tyson, who was another keyboard player. The two of us were in Donnie's band, and we went down with him. So the three of us went down, and we added a bass and drummer down there. And the drummer was Steve Ferroni from the Average White Band. You might got you guys might know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so from Average White and uh, and then the bassist named Neil Jason. Now we knew all our parts because we'd been playing them for a year or two uh, live. But those guys were session players and they came in and played them pretty much cold. And that stuff was not easy. It was complicated yeah. arrangements. Mm -hmm. And so it showed me uh, the level that you have to be to be yeah. a session player, you know. And I do, I've done a lot of country sessions and a lot of rock sessions. You know, I just did some stuff with the Thin Lizzy uh, thing before this thing hit with, um, they have a band over here called... Um, Black Star Riders. Black Star Riders. Black Star, yeah, yeah. 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 So I did both of their, I did, uh, I did a song called Ta Testify or Say Goodbye. And that was played over in, in, in that area in the UK. And then I did uh, their last record. And, you know, Scott was the guitar player from Thin Lizzy. And they're kind of yeah. uh, stopped using the name Thin Lizzy because they are, um, you know, they're doing their own thing yeah. uh, over here. So I, I did that last record and that was a lot of fun. A great band, really great. I love that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I can do those type of things, but um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a first call session player. I'm not like, you know, Steve yeah. Lukather and those guys who go in and read uh, movie soundtracks, you know. But I can do rock and roll sessions and things like that, and blues and all the other country, a lot of country, you know, whatever I need to do within my own realm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, just want to come back to Queen for, for a little bit and then uh, I'd like all to... those guys. I remember <laughs> just for just for a little quick bit. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well talk about Queen since it's like, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Why uh, not? Just just for a little bit. But I want to talk about your your solo album as we finish up as well, Fred. Um but um, who who in Queen did you feel most connected to out of the four of them? Well, I you know I was I was I would take different cars with different guys, you know, because I was the odd man out. I was the the new guy, so I didn't really know what the you know they had four limos and then and then me, you know. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time with Brian. I spent a lot of time with John, uh, and Freddie tended to go his own way, and and I you know Roger and I are friends too. I mean so. I don't know. It was a matter of who I felt closer to. We all, you know, they used to come over to my house sometimes. And when I lived in uh, Canoga Park in Los Angeles, I mean, John used to come over and we'd hang out and Brian and I would get together. I mean, it was very informal stuff. By then we were friends. So, you know, I remember Brian and I going out to do dinner and to delis and stuff. And, you know, and we were just hanging out because we were both in the same city. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt pretty close to all of them. I mean, as far as people, I like them all. And yeah. And we were just having an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. We just had an earthquake. Oh, was, was that, oh, no. that serious that travel there? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So Scary. hopefully it won't. Uh, something move. But anyway, welcome to LA. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Well, let's hope we get to the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything okay there, then? No, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, all good. It's, it's just the usual LA stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's um, happened. We just felt a little tremor. <laughs> um, so, um, just before I just, I just one question. I know, I know you've answered this, and it's and it's maybe seems like it's it's maybe less about you, Fred. But um, 
I, I know you said the last time you saw Freddie was when about 1988 when he played you the Barcelona album. Uh, right. That was, you know, that was about the last time you, you saw him. Is, is that correct? Yeah. That's, yeah, around about that time then, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was hanging out. I was doing a record with Elton called Red Strikes Back, and we were recording in Air London. And it was, uh, I think, around November. And uh, it was when they have Thanksgiving in the States. But I don't think they celebrate Thanksgiving over there. Um, but Roger was having a, a, a get-together with the band and uh, a kind of a Thanksgiving buffet at his condo on the Thames. Yeah. So he invited me over uh, and uh, Ratty, who was, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Rudy, yeah. Peter yeah. Hans, yeah. Uh, a good a friend of mine. And... Uh, one of the best road guys ever and so he invited uh he invited us over and Roddy picked me up and we went over to roger's condo and hung out and all the guys were there you know queen and myself and Roddy. And so we had a great time a great dinner and then freddie asked us to stay afterwards to uh play the monterey cabier thing he'd done uh and that was fabulous so i i told him about it. you know i thought it was great and that was unfortunately the last time i saw him they uh they were doing Queen on the Queen Mary. They were doing an album release. And um, I went down to see that with Mac. Uh, and only two of the guys from the band showed up, which was, which was kind of unusual because most of the guy time it was uh, four guys, you know, doing all these press uh, yeah. releases and stuff. And uh, so only two guys showed up and I, Freddie didn't show up. And uh, I started becoming suspicious that something was not right there, but they had a code, uh, a pack between them that this was not to be discussed yeah uh, which i found out after his passing you know but i suspected something wasn't right he just didn't look right yeah. and that's you know uh they made the announcement that he had aids and the next day he was gone so yeah 88 uh, was the last time i saw him yeah that yeah. um your solo album fred um uh, part-time rebel is that still the title you're going with um yeah it's good yeah um, what can you tell us about it? What's the, what's the vibe of it? Um, it's basically a rock album, mostly. Uh, there's a couple of ballads on there. Um, and I just decided to do everything myself uh, for the most part, uh, not from a bragging point of view, but just from expedience. You know, it's, you yeah. can't call somebody over at one in the morning because you want a bass part or something. <laughs> so yeah. I had been playing bass in a club here every once in a while, and that helped get my chops together a lot more. And I think bass in those terms. So I played all the guitars and keyboards and bass on it and did all the vocals the lead vocals and then uh i called in philip sace uh to help me out he did some background vocals and he also plays a four minute guitar solo on the outro oh, one. Wow. i just let him go i just <laughs> let him go uh so philip helped out and then i have a drummer from a band called matchbox 20 uh, by the name of yeah, ryan. yeah 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 so ryan mcmillan played drums on on the record and a friend of mine from toronto paul delong he played uh drums on a couple tracks and the only other thing I added was um, my friend Ian Gardner played uh, upright stand-up bowed bass on two little tunes, and my wife and daughter sang background on one tune. So that was awesome. pretty much the extent. Yeah, so it was just, but it was a large undertaking to play like 13 songs, you know, uh, yeah. mix them. Awesome. And I was expecting to have a friend of mine mix them, who, you know, he mixed Anthrax and a bunch of bands, and but he got busy, so... Um, I had to do it myself, so uh, that's what happened with the... Uh, intense? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty intense, and uh, now I'm just trying to get it out with the uh, the technical legal stuff, which hopefully I will get cleared up next week. So we should awesome. expect to, to see it this year then, Fred? Is that... Is yeah, that I would say yeah. so. Yeah, I, I, definitely this year. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to give up on it, but I don't get it out this year. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so, it sitting around for too long and, uh, you know, maybe it's an ADD thing or something where procrastination, you know, like yeah. uh, I'll get to it tomorrow, but, you know, but I have to get this finished up and uh, finalized. So I'm trying to devote some time to that now. Yeah. It's the plan, obviously COVID notwithstanding, is it the plan to tour, tour the album and do some shows? Well, the plan is that maybe somebody will listen to it um, <laughs> and then to, then to get famous and then I won't be, you know, I'll unfortunately not be able to take anybody's calls and then I'm, just, I'm, re I'm, I'm reachable. <laughs> yeah, fame is my goal. No, uh, 
you know, I just want to see what happens and throw it yeah. out there. Because nowadays, you know, all the stuff that everybody else used to do for you when you're in these big bands, you know, oh, you just take it for granted. You do your record yeah. and you go on the road and everything. And somehow the record comes out in a month or two and somebody's done everything for you. Yeah. But yeah. nowadays we're all in the same <laughs> you know, bucket doing all the stuff ourselves. And, you know, you're releasing an album and your orthodontist is releasing an album. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody's got one out there now. So it's like, you know, yeah. who, who, who is not releasing an album is the question. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the, I, music, I, I, the music I, business. <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, I'm actually working on a, a new album with my band. So there's another one to add to the list. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but you're a musician. So there's a, you know. You, you, I, I wouldn't say I was a musician. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing your best. I do my yeah. best. Yeah, well, hey, that's better than some, you know. Um, but yeah, and you know, it's just a different, different. The playing field is leveled in a long ways. So some yeah. for good, some for bad, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. maybe if Napster hadn't existed, we'd be in better shape. But oh, yeah. you know, Metallica was right, you know. And <laughs> they said fuck Napster, and then they were right. You should have listened yeah. to Lars and those guys, you know, because they it's said, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah pay for the, yeah, you know, you don't get expected, yeah. you know, expect the lawyer to come over to your house for a brunch on Sunday and just to happen to do a couple of legal briefs for your friends, <laughs> promising him exposure, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> Yeah. giving him a salad you know thanks yeah. very much exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I, exactly. That's it. 100%. I, I definitely yeah. i definitely think um from my own personal experience um i think that the downloading thing has, has really really affected people like on the on the smaller on the smaller level obviously yeah. bands like metallica aren't really going to feel you know a massive no. impact but obviously like say my my band and stuff um we were signed um We've got four albums out and stuff. We were signed to an American record label just as um, basically the decline of record sales was was starting to happen. Yeah, and uh, so it really did affect affect us, and I think it affects smaller bands generally. Yeah, you know. Yeah. What, what What's the name of your band? Oh, <laughs> oh. I hate to say that. Um, it's a it's a it's a death metal band. <laughs> Uh, it's called Man Must Die. That's it. Man Must Die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So family kind of title. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's not, it's not. If, if you're familiar with death metal, it isn't typical death metal. We don't sing about cutting people up or any of that ridiculous stuff. It's more, it's more kind of social commentary sort of vibe. That kind yeah. of vibe. <laughs> But, yeah. Well, plenty of people are covering the cutting people up ass uh, area. Yeah, you I mean, yeah. don't need to cover I'm that not, up. I'm not. I'm not uh, yeah. Marilyn Manson will cover. Yeah, all he'll cover that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But if, you, if you want to laugh, check it out. We're on YouTube. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I will. I'll check it out. Sure. Hey. You know, I mean, but you know, it's uh, it's just a different time. It's uh, a. Yeah. I, I I don't like you know some of the aspects, and I don't like the, the disrespect for musicians sometimes that I see. You know. Yeah. And the trouble is that the now the concept of greatness has been um, has been diluted. You know, when you get a guy like yeah. like I told Philip Philip Sace, who's an incredible artist, not just guitar player but singer, songwriter, everything. And for a while, it was very frustrating to watch Philip. You know, starting to get notoriety, but it was taking a while. And I said, yeah. you know, if this was 1977, you'd be yeah. famous by world famous by now. Absolutely. Yeah. But the trouble is now that uh, you know Philip's great. And some uh, dentist's 13-year-old cousin is apparently great. Yeah. So mm -hmm. people don't own, always know the difference. It's a problem, you know, because yeah. uh, the, this, this, this distillation, of, uh, distillation of, of, of greatness is not good, you know. I mean, before it used to be pretty evident. And uh, some people have lost the, the reference points, you know. Everybody Absolutely. knew Hendrick Hendricks was great. Everybody knew, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan is great. And now it's a different uh, different set of you know rel rel relative points, so yeah. it's hard to know sometimes, and people don't always realize that you know yeah. this guy uh, you know is noteworthy. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, I genuinely think as well. Uh, when you mentioned that, I think now there's a lot of emphasis on um, virtuosity um, uh, rather than songwriting ability. That's just how I, how I feel. Um, yeah. I think there's, uh, there's there's kids out there, you know, on YouTube. Are like shredding guitar or shredding drums or piano or whatever the instrument, but I, I see it. There's a that that the songwriting seems to have taken a complete backward step in that regard. Where these guys can play these things, but if you say write me a song, they, they wouldn't be able to write you a song. Yeah, that's, that's true. The songwriting suffers, and another thing suffers too, which is feel. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, it's different feel. I mean, because if you're watching a death metal band or something and they're playing at, you know, 150 yeah. tempo, I mean, it's hard yeah. to have a feel at that level but that yeah. appeals to that appeals to certain demographic i get yeah. that the mosh pits and all that stuff you know yeah. it's like aggression you go to a concert more it's almost like a cycle it's you know it's like a therapy a psychotherapy yeah. meeting, yeah. you know but yeah. and i respect that talent i mean i understand shredders and all that stuff but it's just that um personally some of that stuff doesn't move me as much yeah as, absolutely uh, it doesn't move me either actually yeah. although yeah. i do like stuff like that but yeah, yeah i mean there's 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 13 year olds who are incredible and, and there's guys who are clinicians you know uh yeah but then you hear robbie robertson play and he's only using or, or the old uh, you know the old stuff the old r&b things and guys are playing two notes you know and yeah and i mean philip could play one note and just shred it you know i Absolutely. mean he can play he's a shredder if he wants to be and it's in in the sense but it's a weird thing with him he plays really fast if he wants to but it's not um lydian mode it's not modal particularly yeah it's mm -hmm. within the blues realm you know uh, rock realm and uh, I miss some of the that's a weird thing with shredding it sometimes takes it out of the the blues area and stuff which I, I tend to like with rock and it almost becomes well like Ingve is a classical player in my estimation yeah yeah yeah, yeah but he has but I, I, I mentioned Ingve I, I really don't like his playing and it is for the reason that you're saying it's very mechanical it's there's no there's no emotion in it. Like, I, well, I don't feel that when I listen to that type of playing. Like, Brian, Brian May was very, you know, he, he could be flashy when he wanted to be, but ultimately it was all in the bends and, you know. Set the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like Brian is a very melodic player, and I always yeah. loved his playing. Uh, he's a melodic player, and he's expressive, and his stuff is very close to vocals he's a vocal it's like you yeah. can hear the yeah, it changed my whole guitar playing approach for, to vibrato because brian has the kind of a brato where he swoops up to a note and then he starts to slowly move yeah. it yeah. So he's not he's not doing this fast vibrato stuff he's 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 doing vibrato like the singer would yeah. sing yeah um, where they hit a note and then they it blooms and it, then you apply the vibrato after that and it Absolutely. made me slow my vibrato down a lot um, yeah. and it's taken years to get that together but yeah Brian's got a unique signature and nobody sounds like him and nobody no. sounded like him people mm -hmm. could sound like him after the fact but it's like people who can play like Hendrix yeah nobody mm -hmm. knows the impact that Hendrix had when he yeah. came out nobody ever sounded like any I mean mm -hmm. now you can turn on your amp loud and you know feedback and you know use your bar and stuff and do a harmonics and tapping and all that stuff but when Hendrix came out nobody could figure out what was going on on the other side of that now on this side it's part of the vocabulary the Hendrix yeah. you know uh, particularly for ballads and things like you know his voicings and and pull-offs and things like things like that but back then there was nobody that remotely sounded like him it was an explosion when he came out that guy was heavy he was like Coltrane in rock you know mm. it was a whole different thing and um seeing it from that side the first time I saw him I saw that I heard the stuff on the record and I thought oh this must be studio production and I saw him and he did it live you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he blew a lot of people including Clapton away when oh he came. yeah oh, absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah so I mean I I respect Clapton's playing now I mean I really I love Clapton's playing I love the stuff he did on the Blues Breakers record and all oh, the early yeah. stuff yeah but um but the whole thing is that, uh, you know, innovation is one thing, but it, it somehow seems to me now that there's so much uh, technical um, virtuosity out there that you've lost sight of the th fact that, you know, in some ways it's the song you've got to serve, you know. Uh, uh, 100 percent It's great if you can play fast, but yeah. Yeah. playing fast gets going kind of old after a while. After you hear it, yeah. it just... Yeah. Yep. It, yeah. I mean, we all... It's nice to be able to play fast, and I strive to play fast sometimes too, just keyboard-wise, but it's so that you don't have to... It's like you have the speedometer. Your gas pedal will go to a certain speed, and you know you got that, but you also have the below that that you can function at and comfortably, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's a hard thing to deal with, but hey, I respect all those players. There's some, there's some guys out there that can really shred and, and do it with emotion and feeling. They're, yeah, they're, those guys are standouts, you know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I think I think of Gary Moore, for example. Yeah, Gary, Gary Moore, yeah. You know, he was one of the, those players that, that was virtuoso but had the feeling and his right. playing, you know. So yeah, yeah. Well, like Van Halen, you knew. Oh, I mean, no, yeah. Eddie, yeah, Eddie. Yeah. I mean, he played yeah. great stuff. I, I mean, to yeah. tell you the truth, I, I was very impressed with, with Van Halen's rhythm playing because he played so far back in the pocket. 
Yeah. And yet he held everything back to get, you know, he, he was just waiting for those. He was a little bit behind the beat in a weird yeah. way. Him and Alex mm -hmm. were, Alex were locked in, mm -hmm. but they were back, you know, yeah. and it yeah. makes it very heavy. Yeah. And, totally. uh, and he doesn't, he's always there and it gets to the stuff that, you know, it, it's just strange. If you put, if you try to play those parts, you kind of end up getting on top of the beat because he's so relaxed and back there mm. yeah. that it's a difficult to play Van Halen stuff, you know? Yeah. Yep. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> my, my my two cents. I, 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 love it, love I suppose it. I suppose it's like similar to uh, ACDC in the way that people think that ACDC is very very easy to play when in actual fact it is not easy to play at not all. Not at all. Yeah, no. to keep that. Yeah, in, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. difficult. It's difficult to play any of the great stuff that 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 is great, you know, because yeah. it's a certain personality that's in in part of them, you know. Yeah, you can you can duplicate it, but can you replicate it? Can you do you know what what somebody's done from an emotional point of view? Absolutely, coming through in their instrument. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and people tend to not always know. You know, they don't know. It's like pornography. They say, "I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it." You know, it's like the same <laughs> thing for, for for music. You know, yeah. uh, but like guys like Eddie, you know, all of a sudden there's a guy playing that you don't know what it is, but he sounds. Yeah. sounds greater than everybody yeah. else you know he's just, so. he's just he's just got something yeah he's got, he's got something that feel yeah. and that's another thing that people forget about is the feel you know and yeah. uh mm -hmm. and uh that's a that's an x factor you have it or you don't sometimes and it's, it's hard to hard to put a finger on it yeah absolutely yep so fred just one more question then <laughs> uh, we can say you we can set you free <laughs> okay i got that turn the meter off <laughs> <laughs> um so the final one is what what is it that keeps you so grounded given your accomplishments in music? Uh <laughs> I didn't know I was grounded. Um, <laughs> well you seem very you seem, I, well, you seem very, very at ease and very, you know, the fact that you you're you're giving us your time, you know, yeah, yeah. It suggests, suggests well, to me that you know that that, that that you're very grounded, you know. Well, I, I, I'm having a good time, man. It's fun. Um, Thank you, man. Sweet. I don't put myself on any pedestal. I just, uh, I, I just, uh, I'm just a working musician like everybody else. I happen to get some good breaks, you know. Um, and I think it may have the fact that I came from a small town um, where if you, you know, if you started uh, bragging about your con accomplishments, you get it like a sucker shot in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had a couple of those. <laughs> I think it's Canada too, because, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and I learned a long time ago for every time, for every guy you think, you know, that the, the, cause I functioned in kind of a gunslinger thing, you know, you're, you're playing, you know, I had to play with Donnie or we were in the best band or one of them in, in, in maybe in the country, but you know, everybody in that band was great player, but you know, I also know who's around and I know that I'm not, you know, when I'm playing, I also know there's a guy named Oscar Peterson who can just with one hand play 10 times better than I can ever hope to play. So I know there's guys, of, you know, I've learned it throughout the years that there's a, a lot of guys who are better, faster, different kind of players, but you try to put yourself into what you do and that's where the individuality comes. And, you know, I think the difference is what you put into the music, you know, and uh, I, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I I'm, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was sort of um, in these bands, but you know, I wasn't trying to, you know, um, to kind of boost my own name or anything. I was just doing a job, you know. So I was happy that I was in them, and I look back, I'm happy that, uh, with the the accomplishments. But um, you know, I I don't go around tooting my horn because I don't see the point, really. You know, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who are. Uh, a lot of great players who I look up to, up to, you know, so I know who's yeah. out there, you know, yeah. and there's guys in basements who are playing, you know, 20 times better than I'll ever play. So I, I know there's, I know there's guys out there. So I'm aware, <laughs> who's, you know, I think when you start thinking you're the king of the hill, that's when you have problems. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Totally. Well, listen, Fred, we're absolutely delighted. You've taken time. I mean, you've been talking to us for, you know, an hour 45 minutes here. And Holy crap. I got to get a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we're still pinching ourselves to be honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah. oh, 
Me too. <laughs> uh, but that's for a different reason. <laughs> uh, why did I agree to this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a good time. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, thank no, no, thank you ever so much, Fred. And um, um, we look forward to hearing the, the new album. And um, mm-hmm. Well, you thanks know, for promoting it. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'll let you know uh, when I get it uh, done. Oh, yeah. That would be fantastic. Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we can do that. We'll, we'll, we'll do a, a little kind of um, podcast on it as well when it comes out. We can, we can have oh, that. Absolutely. Well, and, thank and you. Yeah, that would be yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Well, um, take care of yourself, Fred. And thanks so, thanks so much for, for giving up your time again. And we, we can't say thank you. Enough, yeah. So. yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. You guys too. Take care. And that's a bit, it's been a lot of uh, fun. I got a lot of friends in, uh, in Scotland. I got my friend, actually, Dave Payton. I don't know if he knows all those guys. He's a, uh, Used to be in a band called Pilot, and they had a big, huge say. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Pilot, yeah. I know yeah. the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with uh, the, it's it's magic. So <laughs> he's what? in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. We used to play the Playhouse there and stuff. Ah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brand new, man. Yeah, a lot nice. of good times. Well, Sad. thank you very much, guys, and uh, let's all stay safe, huh? Yeah, yeah. indeed. Take thank care you. of yourself. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Bye. All right, man. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Bye bye. Bye bye. So that was Fred Mandel. I find it hard to digest that, actually. That was just oh, fabulous. I absolutely enjoyed what, enjoyed speaking to him. Um, lads, boys? What a, what a chilled out down-to-earth down guy. Just, Aye. Yeah, brilliant. Aye. Like, I mean, I, uh, you know, we were all a little bit nervous. I mean, you know, at the start, um, obviously, because, of the, you know, the guy... The, the guy's achievements in music, but the guy was such such a, a nice guy. And you know, after a while of speaking to him, it was just like you're talking to somebody you knew. You know, it was just it was just a really personable guy. And uh, I, I'm blown away. You know, the guy's a, a, a legend. Uh, I'm sure he he wouldn't say that because he's very humble. But we we definitely feel that way. Yeah, there's no Absolutely. doubt, no doubt. Um, but um, yeah, no, that was really special for us. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know. Um, you know, I'm sure every, all the listeners out there will definitely get something out of listening to that interview. Um, and um, if, at the very least, it was self-indulgent for us because, you know, we mm-hmm. we enjoyed it a lot and it's made our day. Um, so if no, no one else enjoys it, then at least we've achieved our target. But I'm yeah. sure you will. You're, you're Queen fans. You'll, you'll enjoy this this interview. And, and Fred's just a fantastic guy. Hi. Um, I guess we better wrap things up. So... As we said at the start there, um, if you like what we're doing, you know, get some merch, the wee donation, maybe hit the subscribe button, spread the word. Yeah, right. you give us a review, man. That's important, man. Whatever, right, do it. whatever yeah. platform you use, get on there and give us a review. Even if it's a shite one, still give us, <laughs> still give us it because, uh, you know, that helps just right. get the podcast out there. Aye, and if it's negative, we'll just make sure we get it taken down from whatever platform Aye. you're with. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um so no, everyone, take care, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll stick a few um, hooks out there and see if there's anyone else we can we can get to come in and 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 speak about about Queen. But um, so we are going to take a little bit of a break, and we will be back. Um, I've got a lot of ideas. There's a lot of those solo albums we've still not tackled yet as well. So plenty of Queen chat coming up. Um, we just want to take a wee breather, think about how we're how we're doing the next day, uh, the next bunch of podcasts, and uh, we'll see you then. But if you're listening to this months later, then there'll be no gap because the next one will be <laughs> on your player. So. 